Thanks, Elliot. Okay, so I'm speaking to you guys tonight because I am a witness and an accomplice to the atrocities that were committed in Fallujah in Iraq. Um, I was a Marine. I was in uh, the, my unit was 1st Battalion, 8th Marines in uh, 2nd Marine Division. I don't want to assume that you guys know about what happened in Fallujah, but in November of 2004, there was the second assault of Fallujah, which was one of two major assaults on the city of Fallujah in 2004. The second one was the bigger of the two, and it almost entirely destroyed the city. Um, estimated a third of the city was completely leveled to the ground, another third had major, major structural damage, and uh, the rest of the city minor structural damage. It might be the most brutal single operation in the entire uh, occupation of Iraq. I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe shock and awe bombing was worse, but it's, it's up there in the running for that. Um, anyways, it's, it's difficult for me to admit what, what we did to the people of Fallujah, but the harder part is actually explaining how we just could not see the harm that we were doing. And it's a, it's a really strange phenomenon. Most of the guys in my unit, they were just like myself, right out of high school. Um, I graduated in high school in June 2003, and I was in Iraq by June 2004. By November of 2004, I found myself in Fallujah. Um, I knew practically nothing about Fallujah, except for some of the rumors that I had heard that it was uh, the most dangerous city in Iraq. And apart from its reputation, myself and the other guys in my unit, we knew nothing about it. We didn't know anything about the people that lived there, its customs, its traditions, its history. Um, all we knew was uh, that it was dangerous. About a week before the, the siege began, our command told us that we were going to liberate the city of Fallujah from the terrorists that had taken control of the city. Uh, they told us that all the civilians had left. Um, this was a lie, though. They knew that thousands and thousands of people remained inside the city. Um, they told us that our mission was to sweep through the city and to kill all the terrorists that stayed behind to fight us. They told us that um, these terrorists in the city were comprised mostly of international jihadists bent on some irrational hatred for America, and uh, they opposed our, our way of living, and um, they, their religious beliefs were impelling them to fight against us. Uh, they told us that we should expect 50% casualties, that this would be the biggest battle since Hue City, Vietnam. And they also said that this would be uh, the turning point in the, in the, we were calling it the Iraq War at that time, but I think uh, war is the wrong word for it. They told us that uh, this would break the back of the insurgency, and from here on forth we would bring freedom and democracy to Iraq. Um, they told us this, and we accepted all of that without questioning it. Um, I, in fact, I think I'm a bit of a, a rare case because I never, in fact, believed these lies. Um, I didn't believe the stories about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I didn't believe that uh, our freedom was at stake. I didn't believe that uh, I didn't believe that we were helping Iraqis. In fact, everything that I had seen up until that point told me that we were actually hurting Iraqis. And in a lot of cases, I seen with my own eyes, we ended up killing innocent civilians. Um, also, deep down inside, I, I felt that they had a right to be defending them against us. Uh, maybe that comes from my own background, because my grandmother was a Native American, and uh, my other grandparents were uh, Italian immigrants. But um, I couldn't voice that opinion. That was deep down under the surface. And if I had said that out loud, I probably um, wouldn't have made it out of the Marine Corps too well. Um, however, I think that everyone else in my unit, they really believed those lies that were told to them. And they used those, those lies to justify everything that they did. Um, it, just, it must have been much easier for them, psychologically, to dismiss the Iraqi resistance as a bunch of terrorists, rather than to ask themselves what they would have done if their country was occupied, and if their city was being assaulted by this uh, in, incredible army. Uh, it must have been much easier for them to see themselves the way that they wanted to see themselves, as liberators and the good guys, which is in fact how we saw ourselves. Uh, I, in fact, wanted nothing to do with Operation Phantom Fury, which is what we were calling uh, the second siege of Fallujah. But I was not willing to stick my neck out on the line and to say that I thought it was wrong. I wasn't willing to risk my benefits. I wasn't willing to uh, risk my reputation in my hometown. I wasn't willing to risk um, the, my, my honorable discharge. Because these were all the things I joined for. Were largely selfish motives, the GI Bill, the respect and esteem that comes with being a Marine, and all these other factors that the recruiter sells you on. 
Everyone else in my unit, they might have believed that we were fighting against pure evil in Fallujah. They might have believed that we were liberating the city. Um, maybe there is some psychological explanation for why they could not see the, the harm that we were bringing to Iraqis. I can't speculate about that. What I can say with absolute certainty is what my own motives were, and my motives were largely selfish. Um, so the, the second siege of Fallujah, it started on November 8th officially, and I remember as we were driving from Camp Fallujah to Fallujah proper, we drove through this uh, stretch of desert road. And out in the desert, there were uh, women and children wandering out in the desert. Because our chain of command, they told us that you know, we, all the civilians had left. Um, we didn't have to worry about collateral damage. But they never really explained what that meant, and I didn't understand it until that moment, when I saw women and children living in the desert. That's what happened. 200,000 people became refugees, and they went and lived in the desert, with no food and water, um, no protection from the sun or the desert elements. Um, I remember riding past them and seeing them in the desert, and they drove us to the periphery of the city, where we watched the end of a bombing camp. And during that bombing campaign, I saw us drop white phosphorus on the city. Uh, white phosphorus is highly toxic. Um, it's, it's, I'm told it's a chemical system to napalm. If it lands on a person, it uh, burns the skin right to the bone. And uh, there have been reports of civilians uh, being burned by this. A day later, they uh, drove us into the city. They inserted us right in the, the center. Um, and from this point, we started going house to house. Um, pushing from the point that we were inserted in south. We were going every single room, every single street, looking for who we thought were bad guys uh, to kill them. Um, now, we went inside these people's houses, and there were still family photos up on the wall. There was still food in their refrigerators. There was uh, clothes in their dresser drawers. They took practically nothing with them. They abandoned, they abandoned their entire lives right in those houses. And it was very clear that people lived in those houses just a few days before. Um, and as we entered these houses, there was a great deal of looting going on. Um, we kind of we felt entitled to it. You know, we were the good guys. We were doing this for them, and we didn't think it was any big deal to, to steal from them. And anything that looked valuable, uh, you know, we snuck it in our pack. Fancy teapots, fancy Arabic silverware, things of that nature. I looted out of these houses too. It was pretty commonplace, and the chain of command, to a certain degree, tolerated it. Um, and it's just, I can't explain how we thought that that was okay, because in any other life situation, it's wrong to steal out of people's houses. It's wrong to, to kick people out and to live in the desert. But um, we were the good guys. We were doing this for them. We justified it like that. Um, Now, I was a, a radio man, I was a company, company commander's radio operator, so I wasn't the person kicking in doors, going into houses and getting into firefights like this. Um, I was a bit removed from all the combat, but I was close enough so that I could still see what was going on. And in fact, it was kind of a, a strange situation because I was actually very safe with the officers. There wasn't any like gunfire in my immediate vicinity. It was only just a block away that these firefights were going on. So I was in, I was in this very strange, um, kind of like pocket of security. And I think for this reason, I was able to uh, witness things with a bit of a clearer head than everyone else. Now, as a radio man, uh, maybe about a day or two into it, at a certain point, uh, a call came over the radio that a civilian had been killed. And I found out later um, from someone else that who was there when this happened that there was an old man standing on the side of the road and he had something in his hands. And somebody shouted, hey, he's got something in his hands. And then someone just picked up their gun and shot him. Now it turns out this guy had prayer beads in his hands. And he was just standing there praying. And I, in fact, know the person who shot him. I know him very well. And I'm told that after he did it, he shouted, one shot, one kill, which is a Marine Corps slogan for marksmanship. Now, because my friend tells, said that, it, it tells me that um, to him, he, he wasn't killing someone. He was doing exactly what he was trained to do. He, he could not see it as murder. To him, he was doing his job. He was doing exactly what was expected to him, of him as a Marine. At, um, at a later point in the city, another friend from uh, my platoon, he came running up to me. And he said, uh, Caputi, Caputi, I finally shot someone. And he was so happy. He was grinning ear to ear. 
Um, he really thought he did a good thing. He thought he was doing his job. We, we just could not see it as murder. We were the good guys. We, we were doing this for them. We were, in fact, liberating them. Uh, the looting continued for several days. These um, particular instances of atrocities, these continued for several days. Um, at a certain point, I, I can't really recall exactly what day it started on, but we started uh, using a tactic called reconnaissance by fire. Uh, reconnaissance by fire is when you fire into a house or some area where you don't know what's inside. Um, if you hear screaming or moaning or something like that, then there are people inside. Could be combatants, could be civilians. If you hear nothing, the area is clear and it's safe to go in. Uh, this tactic is completely indiscriminate, and for that reason, it's illegal. Uh, we used it anyways. Our chain of command was very aware that we were using it, and it was tolerated for several days. Uh, we continued to sweep into the city, you know, sweep through the city, and we were met with very impressive resistance. Um, but we always responded to it with overwhelming firepower. If we suspected that there was a resistance fighter inside a house, um, we would just bulldoze the house right on top of them, or fire rockets into it, or fire grenades into it until it just collapsed on top of them. Um, and it was this type of violence that I watched change people in my unit, and a, real, uh, a violent hysteria started to develop around the people around me. People really started to lose grasp on right and wrong. In the, most, in the most obvious way. Uh, at a certain point during the assault, I had to carry the radio up to a rooftop to get a, a better signal. And there was two guys that I knew from my unit there. And one of them turned and looked at me, and he said, uh, Hey, Caputi, did you kill anyone yet? I only got one, but uh, this guy next to me, he got nine. And you, you guys, I wish you could have seen their eyes, because uh, they were absolutely out of their mind. The, the, their eyes, they just weren't there. They, they didn't have human beings' eyes anymore. Later, a friend came running up to me, and he told me about how his team leader had been cutting up the dead body of a resistance fighter looking for the adrenal wind, and uh, how he had tried to drag another dead body in front of an AAV to, uh, for it to be run over. I mean, it was, this, it was to this extent that we demonized the Iraqi resistance. They were less than human, and uh, right and wrong just didn't enter into the equation anymore. People were bragging about posing for pictures with dead bodies, uh, dead bodies of the resistance fighters. They were bragging about the things that they had stolen out of their pockets, the money that they had found in their pockets. Um, one day when I was up on a rooftop, I saw a uh, unit which was to our right, our right flank, bulldozing the entire neighborhood. Uh, it must have been like a fifth of the city, just bulldozed it to the ground. And I know that they were not looking inside those houses first to make sure that there weren't civilians inside hiding. They, they were moving very quickly, they weren't checking. Um, towards the end of the city, this was one of the last days of the assault, which lasted about three weeks, um, we came up to this house that had two resistance fighters in it and a little boy. The little boy was about ten years old. And um, I, I really, I wasn't like directly on the scene, I was back a little bit, so I, I'm not sure how the negotiation process went, if there was a negotiation process. I just know that at a certain point, we started firing grenades into that house until it collapsed on all three of them. And uh, to me, this reflects the, the, the black and white thinking that, that we had at that time. It was a zero-sum game. Win or lose, those resistance fighters had to be destroyed, even at the expense of that little boy's life. Um, for that entire three weeks, everything that I was witnessing was complete madness. And I really, I think that I was the only person who was able to, to witness it this way. And I think it was because, like I said, I was a bit more detached than most. I was the company commander's radio operator. I wasn't directly in these firefights. Um, I was close enough to see what was happening, but there was a lot that I couldn't see. Um, I saw the people that we had forced up to the desert. I saw their destroyed homes and their dead bodies. But I couldn't see what any of this had to do with me. I still could not see myself as being complicit in this. I kept telling myself that I didn't want to be here, that I was obligated by contract to do this that I told myself that I was doing this for the guys to my left and right, that I was doing this just to, to do what I had to do to get back to my family. None of that was true, though. At any, every single day, I decided to follow orders. Every single day that I did this, I was making a choice. Um, I could have chosen to follow orders or not to, but I chose to follow orders, and I did so because it was in my best interest. Like I said earlier, I was in it for the Montgomery GI Bill. I was in it for uh, the respect and esteem that I would get from my family. And if I had followed that feeling in my gut and done what I had known was right, I would have risked all of that, and I wasn't willing to face that. 
I do not know how to explain the absurdity of our mission in Fallujah or in all of Iraq for that matter. We occupied a country in order to free it. We assaulted a city in order to save it. We, we justified all of this by claiming that we were doing this for people who we considered to be the enemy. Uh, we told ourselves that we were liberating Fallujah, uh, liberating the civilians of Fallujah, even though that we knew that, we were, that the civilians were being killed and displaced and hurt. Uh, we justified all this to ourselves by asserting that collateral damage was just a fact of war. That, uh, that we were doing this for them, and this was for their freedom and their democracy. We justified our actions to ourselves so well that we could not understand why the people of Fallujah were not thanking us. And after all, we were risking our lives for them. Uh, and it seemed like with every civilian that we killed, we asserted to ourselves more strongly, and we believed with more conviction than before that we were doing this for them. When we went back home, we were welcomed back as heroes. Our friends and families, they threw big parties for us, and one guy in my unit, his hometown, even threw a, a parade in his honor. Um, some guy started interviewing us for a book that he was writing called Fallujah with Honor, and a documentary filmmaker started following us around to make a documentary about us. Most of the guys from my old unit, um, they have not been able to think about Fallujah outside of that context ever since. Uh, they just can't see their actions as being anything but heroic, and they can't think of our friends that died as having died for anything but a noble cause. What really blows my mind about all this though is just how easily decent and normal people can be driven to commit atrocities and how they can even see those actions as being virtuous. Um, the thing about it though is that it very easily could have been me. Um, I could have been the guy kicking down doors and I could have been the guy kick, uh, mutilating dead bodies in Fallujah. And I think it's only by circumstance that I wasn't. I really think that you could take any group of people in the world and if you told them all the same lies that we were told and you told them that half of them weren't, weren't going to make it out of that alive, that they would commit all the same atrocities that we committed in Fallujah. I'm no better or worse than any of the people that I just mentioned who did all of these awful things. And in a way, I might be worse because the guys that did all those awful things, they might have believed the lies that were told to them about Fallujah. They might have believed that they were liberating people, that uh, they were helping the city, and uh, they might have had you know, the right intentions. Me, however, on the other hand, I knew better. I knew that I didn't believe the lies that were told to us. I knew we were in Fallujah for all the wrong reasons, but I decided to follow orders anyways. And I did that because I wanted free action, uh, a free college, and a combat action rhythm. So we'll now vote um, questions. Uh, it's a lot to take in, um, but uh, if you have questions for either one of us, we will be more than happy. Yes. I have a couple questions. First, for you, Dahlia, just a little bit on the fact that Barack Obama claimed to withdraw most combat troops from Iraq. What are the conditions now in Iraq? It's basically been out of mainstream media. Give us a quick update. Sure. Um, well, uh, just to uh, elaborate on the, the notion that the, there are still combat troops on the ground. Um, well, first of all, there is no such thing as a non-combat troop. Um, and uh, everybody's trained to kill. Um, I think just about everybody's carrying a weapon. Um, but whether Obama calls them combat or non-combat, the Iraqi people don't make a difference. Um, they're occupiers. Um, so there are around 50,000 US soldiers still on the ground. Um, and But the, those who have been redeployed from Iraq have been replaced by mercenaries. Uh, so, um, so it continues on a daily basis. Um, as you said, it's not making the news. Uh, but uh, Iraqis continue to die every day. From time to time, there was a news report of one or two U.S. soldiers dying in Iraq. Um, and uh, in the uh, in the sort of the, the flood of, of uprising in Western Asia that's gone on, there were big demonstrations. Uh, I think it was February 14th was marked as the the day of uprising in Iraq. Uh, and uh, just online, I saw the videos that people were posting and. Uh, very, um, there were there were bodies, a lot of dead bodies in the street. Some of them cut in half, 
so it's not clear to me what was used to accomplish that, but this is not small arms fire. Um, so this is the, the same brutality of occupation that continues. Uh, and this is um, the, the one thing that, uh, that I do want to point out about those demonstrations, though, is that they were pulling down uh, the sectarian cement walls in Baghdad. Um, and so this is that the division of Baghdad into purely Sunni, purely Shia neighborhoods is something that has been imposed by the occupation. Um, those barriers, those big cement barriers, uh, which, which I think, they're, I think they're miniature versions of what were called Bremer walls, uh, which those massive cement barriers that were like, I don't know, 23 feet high that surround um, the complexes uh, around the green zone. But these were uh, smaller versions, all put up by the United States Army Corps of Engineers, being pulled down by Iraqis who are opposed to these divisions. Um, so uh, resistance continues. Uh, unfortunately, the death toll continues. Um, but we can be sure that, uh, that American soldiers will stop dying there uh, when they're all brought completely home. Um, oh, uh, uh, also want to thank you. Um, especially for Fallujah, um, the impact of the major bombardments is, uh, is, the, is coming to fruition now. Um, especially in Fallujah, which had such heavy bombardment during the, 2000, uh, the April and November 2004 sieges. Today in Fallujah, uh, there are one in three births uh, is, a, is a newborn with congenital abnormalities. This is an, an unprecedented uh, incidence uh, of, uh, of birth defects. Um, and what they're seeing in, uh, there's an article from The Independent, a British paper that's called The Toxic Legacy of, uh, of Armaments in Fallujah. Um, and that is what they're finding is that the incidence of leukemias uh, are now uh, double what was seen in Hiroshima after uh, using the atomic bomb. Um, so whereas there was a 17-fold increase in leukemias uh, in, the, in the time following uh, dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, 17-fold for Hiroshima, 38-fold for Fallujah. And the same, uh, there is now uh, the, ins uh, the phenomenon of a decrease in live male births. Um, there's a disproportion, you expect about half the births to be female, half male. But now there's an abnormally higher ratio of, um, of female births. And that's comparable to what was seen in Hiroshima uh, after using the atomic bomb. These are the same uh, effects uh, from uranium. Um, so the most likely etiology of, uh, of this health crisis is our use of depleted uranium, um, which is a little bit more of a conversation, but basically this is ongoing. We continue to use depleted uranium in our armaments, we continue to contaminate Iraq and Afghanistan and every soldier and civilian uh, who is on the ground there. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, that's the long-lasting impact that uh, is going to um, devastate them for years to come. Well, thank you, by the way. Um, I'd like to say first that from where I sit, uh, you at least, at the very least, did not seem worse than your fellow soldiers, uh, quite a bit better than I would say, and I hope uh, your conscience clears up to some extent. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, did you suffer any uh, major psychological trauma, and by what process did you actually come to realize that you uh, weren't uh, doing the right things there in Iraq? Um, you know, when within less than a year, um, I got out of the Marine Corps for, um, I told them I had PTSD and that I didn't want to be part of it anymore. At the time, I really believed that I had PTSD. Um, now, looking back on it, I just think I felt guilty about being complicit in uh, illegal occupation and um, doing what we did in Fallujah. 